session where we're going to look at stewardship, how pension funds engage with the companies that they invest in, um, a, a vitally important and really timely topic. I say that my name's Luke Hilliard, I'm the policy lead for stewardship and corporate governance at the Pensions and Lifetime Savings Association, so I kind of um, uh, coordinate all our work in this area. Um, I think there are three kind of factors that drive our interest in, in the topic. Um, firstly, the, the, the notion that better stewardship leads to better returns. Uh, there's an increasing volume of evidence to support the, the fairly intuitive argument that by being engaged stewards of the strategy, culture, governance, environmental and societal impact of the, the companies they invest in, that pension funds and, uh, uh, and other investors can, can yield better returns. Um, secondly, it's a hugely, uh, there's a hugely increased policy interest in this area. We've seen in recent years the introduction of the stewardship code. This year, the, um, the uh, DB code, uh, the DB investment guidance uh, references the, the materiality of, uh, of ESG issues. It talks about how pension funds need to be uh, familiar with the stewardship policies of their asset managers and seek to influence them where appropriate. We've also got um, uh, documents like the Investment Association's Productivity Action Plan, looking at the role that uh, asset owners as stewards of investee companies can play in driving the UK's productivity, one of our major economic challenges. And of course, there's been the big corporate governance reform green paper that again looks at how investors engage with the companies that they invest in. Uh, and then I suppose the, the third factor that, that drives our interest in the, t the topic is the rapidly increasing uh, member and societal interest in the impact of, uh, the, the, that uh, scheme members' pensions have on the, on the world that they live in. This is something that, uh, an interest that's sort of being manifested through, uh, through the media, through campaign groups, and also uh, channeled directly in member representations to, uh, to pension funds. I think thinking about our own work at the PLSA for all, for all the, uh, uh, the brilliant uh, research and, uh, and information gathering that my colleagues do on topics like GMP re reconciliation or whatever. It's the, uh, the, the, the conduct and governance of the companies that pension funds are invested in that, uh, that sort of generates the most media interest uh, for us. Uh, and I should, before I start, um, if you'll give me the privilege of wishing on a couple of seconds longer, I should plug our own Stewardship Central website where we've got all sorts of guidance on quizzing fund managers, uh, on engaging with companies over their working practices, uh, and the various consultation responses we've done on this topic. Um, today, to talk in more detail about the subject, we have um, working from my left to right, Catherine Howard from Share Action, the Responsible Investment Campaign Group, who many of you will know and perhaps have worked with. Michael Marshall from the West Midlands Pension Fund, who's going to give a very sort of practical perspective of, uh, of engaging with these stewardship issues uh, as a pension fund. And then Leon Carmi from Hermes, the Investment Manager and Engagement Services Provider. So what we'll do is each of the speakers will, uh, will talk about their work uh, you know, and how and what, why stewardship is, uh, is an important issue and what they do about it. Uh, and then we'll have some time for plenty of questions at the end. And you can, if you're, uh, uh, you don't want to uh, speak up in front of the whole room, you can submit qu questions to me via the conference app. So I think we'll start off with, uh, with Catherine. Thank you very much, Luke. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, Share Action uh, has been championing stewardship as highly relevant to um, the outcomes and interests of, of pension savers for over a, a decade. And I guess it, it, the underlying belief is that uh, pension funds are owners of assets on behalf of members. And there's just this very sort of intuitive sense, a bit like if you own a car or own a house, um, if you look after it, it will um, probably be sort of worth more in the long term and, and not break down at critical moments when you're on the M6 or whatever it is. And that tackling problems early um, and spotting them and being kind of focused on um, issues that crop up um, are, uh, is, 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 is the right approach and it is kind of a duty in the sense of a, of a fiduciary. 
And it's obviously particularly true um, in public equities and, you know, shareholders have voting rights, um, but it's extremely true in other um, asset classes. And I'm, I hope that Leon will say something about the work that they're doing in terms of real estate and, um, and private equity and infrastructure. These are all asset classes where it pays to be a very engaged steward. But despite that, I think one has to accept that um, historically, a lot of what happens in capital markets is very, very focused on sort of trading in, trading out, um, and, and less on this, you know, arguably less sexy process of just really monitoring and keeping an eye on what goes on in these um, uh, underlying wealth creating entities. Um, so uh, for us, uh, it's just a given that good stewardship will pay off uh, for pension funds. Um, but it's, it's tricky because obviously it's not the process that pension funds themselves typically get involved in. Some of them maybe do, but mostly it's delegated to asset managers who often and increasingly talk a very good talk about uh, what they're doing in the stewardship space. And actually, it is not simple to differentiate between the ones that are really doing a very diligent job um, and those that aren't. And I think it's very important that the investment consulting sector um, puts more time, and this is definitely happening, which is excellent, into really scrutinizing the stewardship capabilities of um, different asset managers that pension funds are using. Um, and although the stewardship code is a fantastic development um, coming off the back of the financial crisis, the reality is that a vast number of the large asset managers used by UK pension funds are in tier one. There's actually very, it's not easy just looking at who's in tier one and who's in tier two to really distinguish who is doing a good job um, in the asset management sector on this. Now, um, Luke asked me to speak a little bit about an initiative that um, we have uh, got started in the last year, which the PLSA has been fantastically supportive over, called the Workforce Disclosure Initiative. And the underlying premise is a simple one, that uh, the way that companies manage people is an extremely important indicator of whether they're a, a good firm um, and whether they're a good investment for you. But actually, the, the, the information and reporting on workforce issues um, from companies is quite uh, variable um, and quite poor on the whole. There are a small number of companies that uh, do a really good job of reporting to investors. Um, uh, SSE, um, the uh, utility company, would be a good example of a really excellent company with leading practices and leading to sort of reporting and disclosure on the interesting ways they have been trying to work with their workforce um, to get the very best out of people. And it's um, you know, very much part of their proposition as an investment and as a company you might uh, buy shares in. But the vast majority of publicly listed companies around the world do a really poor job on this. But there's lots of evidence now that where companies manage people well, and again, this is very intuitive in a sense, but where companies manage people well and have really good processes and are really clever about training and development and talent development and you know, not just getting women on boards but really developing um, women and making sure they come back to work and, and can use their skills, these are really leading indicators of great firms to be invested in. So we have built something called the Workforce Disclosure Initiative. Um, so far, very pleased that um, investors with nine trillion of assets under management around the world have signed up to be co-founding signatories of this initiative. We, it's a pilot year at the moment, so we sent um, surveys to 75 um, major, major blue, kit, blue chip companies around the world, and um, the deadline actually f closed yesterday for people to submit. Um, the, last the last company to submit on the deadline was Microsoft, so that's going to be very interesting to see um, how Microsoft are managing people. Um, but we hope this is going to become a really important source of data for um, investors to begin to ask questions. Are you doing this well? Um, how are you managing that asset? I mean, every company says our people are our greatest asset, um, but uh, Cat, you know, this is a really interesting area for stewardship, um, and, uh, and 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 I, well, I want to link it back quickly um, before moving on um, 
to, to pension savers. I mean, pension savers, by definition, are workers. Um, I don't know if anyone saw the front cover of the FT today, but it's showing that um, a huge part of the UK population under 35 are in an incredibly tough financial situation. Um, and, 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 and what I think pension savers are looking for uh, in the future are pension funds that are really engaged with these issues that relate to their real lives. What is my situation at work? Um, and will I be able to save for a pension for the future? So I think it's one of those issues that really loops back to the core purpose of the pensions industry. Um, and it would be great uh, to support and work with other investors um, in this room and beyond um, who are interested in that as a, as a key area of, of stewardship work for the future. Cool, brilliant, Catherine. I think that's a, that sort of point about um, the kind of fiduciary duty in a holistic sense, the, the way that um, pension funds investments shape the world and the, the working practices that influence their members' lives as well as um, generating returns for them is, is a really important one. Um, Michael? Thanks, uh, Luke. Um, I work for West Midlands Pension Fund. My role is to oversee the Responsible Investment Programme at the fund. Uh, we are a £15 billion pound defined benefit local authority scheme uh, based in Wolverhampton and as many of you will know from April next year we'll be uh, pooling our assets into LGPS Central uh, along with some, uh, some geographically uh, related uh, pension funds, uh, other local authority schemes. Responsible investment is an integrated uh, part of, of, our, of our investment process. It's, we don't do stewardship as a knee-jerk reaction to investments that we already make. We look at responsible investment uh, risk factors before we make the investment and afterwards as part of stewardship as well. For us, it really flows from our fiduciary duty. We think these things are long-run determinants of value. And so we think that we, of course, have to look at them. Our responsible investment framework essentially falls into two pillars, one of which is stewardship and the other, uh, other component is selection. So that goes for manager selection, but it also goes for our internal arrangements as well. About half of our money is run internally, all listed equities. So half of my job is working with internal uh, investment managers on directly integrating the Swanson investment uh, into, uh, into the processes that we have. So the mandates that we have for our internal arrangements all have a responsible investment component. The investment process documentation that we have for, for our internal arrangements all have re responsible investment programs. Our IMAs for our external arrangements all have responsible investment components, LPAs, and you name it. It's not something that we do separate to the investment function. It's very much part of, of the core investment function. And we're, we're looking at financially material issues in the main. Um, we think that there definitely is a stewardship premium, and we think that because there is a governance discount with, with many stocks that, that we have. Uh, we don't think that's a reason necessarily not to invest. We think that in many cases it enables a valuation to come into, our, into a range that we can invest in, and then we can work with the company, erode that governance discount over time, and increase the value of our investment. So I completely agree with, with Catherine that, that what you're able to do with stewardship is to polish your investments, look after your, your car, or whatever it is, um, over, over the holding period, and, and increase or at least preserve shareholder value. So for us, it, it's a fairly mainstream concern. It's like any other investment. In fact, there's nothing, nothing special about it. What we do in selection informs what we do in stewardship, and what we do in stewardship informs selection as well. So we, we might uncover risks during our due diligence process or when we're developing a stock uh, thesis uh, and if we look at something and we think, oh, maybe there's an unmanaged risk, risk there, that will inform whether we prioritise that company for engagement over the next 12, 18, 24 months and so on. And of course, once we go through a round of, of stewardship, whether it's engagement, voting or whatever, then we'll update our beliefs about that company or that asset as well, and that will inform our, our decisions uh, in the future. In terms of stewardship, we do, we do roughly uh, two things. No surprise, we do engagement and voting. And once again, those two things are, are inherently related as well. So the conversations we have with companies, whether it's in partnership with other asset owners or whether it's um, just by ourselves with, with our direct engagements, that will inform how we cast our vote. Those two things are not separate and distinct uh, events. Um, and how we voted will inform uh, our engagement targets for the future. We do quite a lot of work in partnership. We're quite a large uh, asset owner by UK standards, but we, we often don't have the kind of influence that, that we might have if we were 
uh, larger in size, so that, that necessitates the use of, of partnerships. So we use things like the PRI, we use IRGCC, we're also a signatory to, to WDI, and if there are investors in the room, please do sign up. It's a great initiative, and there definitely is a disclosure gap uh, in, in that particular aspect. Um, and, and we have also joined, in fact, we were found a partner of the Transition Pathway Initiative, which is a, a, a great way to, to monitor whether companies are um, aligned with, with a two degrees uh, path. So if, if you think that something like Paris will be implemented, and if a company is very much divergent from, from, from the Paris Accord, <coughs> then you might want to target that company for engagement. The Transition Pathway Initiative allows you very quickly to do that. So partnerships uh, are, are a very important part of what we do. We are also a very active member of the Local Authority Pension Fund Forum. Um, we don't just sign up to these things and tick a box and leave it. We're, we're on the executive of that particular forum, and a lot of what we do on stewardship uh, is carried out by the forum. And again, it's not just uh, us outsourcing. Uh, we ourselves will go to, to meet companies, and we ourselves will go to AGMs and raise issues uh, with companies. Um, so it, it's a very uh, involved process. I'm a bit of a rare species in, in local authority pension fund world. There's only, I think, three of us. Um, but I'm not an endangered species because uh, as you move towards pooling, uh, I think that, that standards will be raised. I don't think things will sink to the lowest common denominator. I think pooling is a great opportunity for response and investment to be done in the appropriate way. Great. Thanks, Michael. And again, some really, um, for, for me, as somebody who looks at this issue on a kind of industry-wide kind of <coughs> policy basis, to hear some quite detailed info about your um, practical work, voting, voting, engaging, um, using the partnerships with LAF, the PRI, the Workforce Decl Disclosure Initiative as well is, is really useful kind of practical perspective. Um, Leon? Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, for those who, who, who don't know Hermes, Hermes um, uh, runs money, is an investment manager runs about £35 billion pounds across different asset classes, including real estate, infrastructure, um, equities, uh, credit, and, and also in, in private equities. We also provide an engagement or stewardship service, and we're privileged to represent there about 40 institutional investors worldwide and just approximately £350 billion pounds of assets under advice there. Our mission is to help retirees retire better um, and what, what do we mean by that? Because clearly the investment return is really important and we are focused on delivering that investment return which gives the, the, the pensioner an income to spend in retirement. But we also believe there is another part of the return which we and the industry should be striving to deliver. And, and that is, if you like, the social or environment impact of, of the investments we, we, we make or, or we steward. So to give you a simple example, you could achieve a 1% per annum greater than the benchmark return by investing in a company who are investing in a carbon intensive project. But that 1% additional return which you might deliver could well be swamped by the higher energy or food prices caused by the, the increase of carbon in the atmosphere, which um, is, is bad for the beneficiary, will completely be swamped, swamped by that. So we believe we need to think about a holistic return um, which we, we, we're looking to deliver for beneficiaries and clients. And there are some challenges in, in doing that in, in the sense that, first of all, the industry as a whole is very short-term in focus. And that's across the industry, from the asset owner, certainly to the asset manager, and feeds into to what we're asking for from, from, from companies as well. So that's one big issue. Another, another one is sustainable solutions don't always achieve the return on investment in the short term. And that's a real... It's a real challenge, um, but we can, break, we can break that challenge and break that, break that trade-off. An example, as, as Catherine mentioned, I'll, I'll mention a real estate example. So we've been, again, privileged to partner with Arjun on the King's Cross transformation. It's achieved um, a greater than 20% internal rate of return, so really good, good um, investment return for, for the shareholders. But we've also been able to deliver not but, and we've also been able to deliver some great social environment impact. There's some great open spaces in that area which, is, which are open to all. You've got the University of Arts there, which in, in, in increases the cultural uh, benefits of, of the area. We have a, a school for, um, for deaf children, a, uh, a school for, for other children in there. There is affordable housing alongside um, other, other, other housing. We've got 8,000 square meters of green roofs. 
um, some, some really good uh, investment in energy efficient uh, power as well. So we've got the social environment impact and the investment return and in those cases they are feeding off each other in a really good way. Not every case is like that so we have to think harder and that's where stewardship I believe comes into play. Engagement comes into play, both engagement with the asset, the company, um, or another asset if it was a, a, a building, um, but also advocacy because sometimes the, the, in all the will in the world, the, the company has a fiduciary duty, its own fiduciary duty. It needs to think beyond that to, to become a sustainable company, but, but sometimes you need advocacy, you need um, work done at a policy level and at standard setting level to move things, move things ahead. Now, Luke asked me to give you some examples of engagement to point out where there may have been successes, but also to think about where there may have been failures or something, something in between. Because engagement in some ways is still in its infancy, uh, and um, even though it's a critical part, I believe, of what any, any person in the investment chain should be doing, it's, it's, it's a really important part of your, your fiduciary, um, it's still not really, it's still not really taken, taken off. So I'm going to give you three examples. One, the banking sector. Second, uh, extractives and climate change. And the third one, in emerging markets, engagement in emerging markets. So if we take the banks, it was impossible to engage with the banks before the financial crisis. Brick wall. Anything you might have raised around the board composition or or whether the, the returns were real or not, would have, would, you would not have, to have, have achieved much. And in fact, we could say the investment industry was complicit in encouraging um, those higher ROEs, whatever the leverage might be, those higher return on, in, on equities, whatever the leverage, the amount of debt which was fueling, fueling that. Post-crisis, a certain amount of reality set in. And as investors, we did have more leverage in the discussion with the companies. And, and the engagement... I would say has, has gone around board composition, who should be on the board, on executive remuneration, on what should be in the business portfolio, investment banks, retail banking, and fourthly on conduct. So on board composition, I would say there have been quite a lot of successes. There's been some real changes on the board, different people coming on the board. I would suggest they're more independent and you've got more of the right skills on the board, less lost looking like clubs than they might have been, might have been before some banking knowledge on the board, um, and also importantly, some IT knowledge on the board, because banks are also IT firms in many ways. B um, but I would still say the board's maybe a bit too, bit too big. Um, in the US, you've still got a lot of chair ch chief executive combinations. In the UK, that's, that's not so much true. But on the whole, relatively good success on changes to board composition. On executive remuneration, there's also been successes. There's been a lengthening of the time frames which performance is measured on. Um, CRD4, so there's a, a bit of uh, policy coming in, has made those, um, those remuneration schemes less leveraged um, and also, I think, brought quantum down. And society has come into play. There's a number of banks for some time who wouldn't take a bonus at all because it would just not have flown. Um, in, in, in when it, when it hit, hit, hit the press. But we still have real difficulties on remuneration in banks. And I think fundamentally, whilst we can see what pay is being paid, we don't really know how to understand what performance has been achieved. Because when a bank does what it does, some of its gains are realised, so in cash, but vast majority are unrealised. And some unrealized gains are never going to be realized. And it's really difficult to know from the outside. Well, obviously, that was one of the reasons why we had the crisis, because no one could really answer that. And we're not re we don't really, haven't really got grip to grips with what the gains are. So that's a little bit on, on, um, on remuneration. On business portfolios, we've got, we had a, had a reduction in, into investment banks, which were not making a return, but yet um, paying the investment bankers a lot. So we've seen a, a bit of reduction there. I believe that investment banks should really be um, partnerships. The part a partnership is able to bring good governance to what, um, what deals uh, an investment bank may or may not take on. And then, very difficult one, conduct. Conducts, a bank's obviously, as you probably know, has cost um, the, the banks and its shareholders $320 billion of fines over, over the years, but has also caused that mistrust between the bank and society as a whole. 
In the FT article, which Catherine mentioned earlier, I think it did talk about still about 60% of people not trusting the financial services industry. Huge mistrust. Um, really important for banks to have that license to operate. Now, the banks have responded, and you do have very shiny policies. You've had a huge amount of money being thrown at compliance. Um, and I think genuinely the banks want to do what's right by, by conduct, but it's really difficult from the outside to engage on conduct. We will meet with the head of risk, we'll meet the head of conduct, that's on the executive side, that's on the non-executive side, we'll understand, try and understand what their processes are, um, what their governance structures are, and we'll try and understand if there was an issue, how they dealt with it. But it's still really hard to see to what extent banks are changing in terms of conduct. Now, I've talked quite a lot about banks, and I'm probably already into, into quite, quite far. And I'll, I'll try and speak very quickly about the other two examples. Um, extractives and clim climate change. So uh, there's a lot of climate change which are associated with extractives, partly because when you take whatever you're taking out of the ground or uh, wherever you're taking it out of, there's quite a lot of carbon which is emitted. And then, especially obviously with oil and gas, where it's used, um, also can lead to a lot of, lot of carbon emissions, whether that's in your car or in, in, in an aeroplane um, or in a power plant. So carbon emissions is a big issue in, in extractives. The focus of engagement has been on disclosure. I don't know how many of you have heard of the Aiming for A coalition. Carbon disclosure project, they rate different uh, companies on how well they disclose carbon. And A is the top grade. So Aiming for A is trying to encourage companies to achieve that A grade. Um, and led by, um, I think, the Church of England and, 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 and some, other, some other investors, a group of investors have encouraged and put shareholder proposals forward to encourage companies such as Rio Tinto, Shell, um, Glencore to, to, to better disclose. And this has been a success um, in the UK because the companies have come on board and they have asked shareholders to support um, those, those resolutions. It's been a different story in the US where companies have not necessarily done that. And over in the US, the, one of the, the shoots, green shoots, is that some of the investors, some of the big passives who historically would never have supported a shelter resolution like that have started to feel the pressure and have started to support those resolutions. So disclosure is, is important in, in, in climate change. It's important because as the adage goes, sunlight is the best disinfectant, so just being able to see things is important. But by making those disclosures, the company's thinking hard about what it, should be, what it should be doing. But there's a long way to go in terms of climate change and extractives, energy mix, and what technologies they should be using, um, how as a sector they should be coming together to, to try and solve some, some of those issues. And obviously, it's turkeys and Christmas in a number of parts of the extractive industry. And so that's a challenge when you're, when you're engaging. In emerging markets, I would say it's all about access. The engagement you're doing at the moment, we're doing at the moment is to try and get access and try and get some of the issues which matter to investors um, on the table um, and building those relationships in a collaborative and a constructive way, not in a combative way, is, is a key. So we, you know, we, we strive to go and visit Hon Hai's um, uh, plants not just talk, talk about things from, from afar, but actually go out there and, um, and visit. And that builds a relationship. Hon Hai spoke at our client advisory council, which was great, that they, that they would feel that they want to do that. And they, according to external parties, they have improved um, uh, the labor conditions, working conditions, which is, was, was, was so important for them to do. With China Mobile, um, we've engaged with them on difficult issues such as bribery and corruption, and we're seeing change there in terms of the policies and controls which, uh, which, which they brought in. More difficult are governance issues, because you've got a lot of state founds, state um, uh, stakes in emerging market companies and founder stakes. So again, we're trying to say if you have more independence on the board, it'll, be, it'll attract more investors to you. So emerging markets, different. Um, but still, engagement can have an impact. But there are engagements not straightforward. There are there are challenges. Um, and going forwards, I would say, depending on where you are. But if we if we were in the UK, the UK, I'm finding from 15 years ago when I started doing this, 
um, I'm finding the UK boards to be much more engaging, much more, much more receptive. We still clearly got an issue on remuneration. It's a big issue. You still have issues such as Sports Direct where the founder um, and the board are not going, not, not going to see um, investors on a one-to-one -one basis. So we do have those issues. But on the whole, the UK is not too bad. And I think engagement now needs to move to another phase where we're working collaboratively with companies and supporting companies who want to take a long-term view. Um, and, uh, and I think that's going to be, that's going to be quite effective. Brilliant. Thank you, Leon. Some really good case studies there that really helped us kind of bring to life what um, engagement is all about. Um, we've got quite a bit of time for questions now. Um, does anybody, before I abuse <laughs> chair's privilege and jump in with some questions of my own, would anybody from the audience like to uh, offer a question? Um, yeah, lady, just down at the front here. If you could just wait till the microphone gets here in order that the, uh, the viewers at home uh, benefit from the question as well. And if you wouldn't mind just saying who you are and before you're uh, before asking as well, please. Hi, it's Vera Hegarty from BNP Paribas Asset Management. And it's a question for Michael, really. Um, you were talking yesterday about um, measurement. And I suppose what I'd be interested to know is what are the biggest challenges that you find around measurement across the whole portfolio and not just the equity part? Um, I think that the, one of the things we do at Westminster is, is to say there's a lot of heterogeneity and we're not going to have a templated approach and try and measure everything using the same kind of ESG rating. So we have bespoke processes across different parts of the portfolio. And then that makes man, uh, measurement difficult uh, because you, you can't add these things up because they're, they're not in, in common forms of uh, common units of measurement. Um, so we satisfy ourselves with, with the fact that we've done the right kind of thing in the right asset class and, and we, we don't try and sum them up. We, we were part of an <coughs> informal working group with some other asset owners looking at how you could, for example, do a carbon footprint across uh, all your asset classes. And um, this project um, cost quite a lot of money. Uh, thankfully, it was in, in partnership with others. And we came to the conclusion that we just couldn't do the same kind of measurement for sovereign bonds that we could for private equity, that we could for listed equity and so forth. So I think that... We need to keep thinking about the, the measurement issue, but not to obsess about it. Thanks. Yep. Any other questions? Yep, uh, there's a gentleman just here and at the uh, back as well, um, front row here, yep. Good morning, Glon. Uh, this is from Croydon. You talked about the bank remuneration at the end of the Israel, which is common practice. We never tried to cover up those guys we like the fund, we like the local threat to vote against the renominations. But when it comes to look at the figures, how they work out, it seems that there are big shareholders like the fund managers who support them. And how can <coughs> you control those fund managers who side with the bank managers for those drop big renomination? So is that, that question about the, the remuneration. remuneration of the fund managers who are supposed we, to be holding yeah, the... Yeah, the shareholders who vote against it. Yeah, 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 that's something we certainly get asked about a lot. If it's all right, I might just take a group of questions uh, and then take them as a three. So I think there was somebody at the back there had a question. Uh, John Pantor, Greater Manchester Pension Fund. One of the problems I find is that people sometimes don't realise where the major problem comes from. Manchester Airport, 8% of the emissions come from ground transport, cars, lorries, etc. The airport makes a lot of money from that. And people are often worrying about the sky, but we also need to worry about the ground, but it would cost them money uh, and consumers mightn't like it. You know, so that sometimes we need to focus where the real major issue comes from, uh, which is manageable, which is you know, something like ground transport at airports. Uh, and there was one just down at the front here, if we could get a mic. Hi, it's uh, Ken Monroe from Babcock. I think probably a follow-on from that previous question, so, and specifically against the case that um, Leon mentioned, although Michael hinted at it, but I'm not quite sure, <laughs> in regards of driving that um, um, co corporate responsibility, do you actually engage with willing partners or are you using this issue as a driver to go with unwilling partners? You mentioned the King's Cross issue particularly. Were they gonna do stuff anyway and you help them to achieve best practice or would, do you think they would have ignored it without your input? So you actually engage at the bottom level and therefore drive that standard up? Great, really good question. So um, executive pay, 
identifying uh, where emissions come from, oh, you know, how, how attributing emissions, I suppose, <laughs> and um, willingness of investees to engage. Um, I don't know uh, um, if you'd like to go first, mm -hmm. Leon, or Catherine, were you going to? We don't know, Leon can go first, and then I'll, yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, I think incentives um, and investor incentives, if I understood the first question right, I think investor incentives are, are really important. Um, and I think you need to look, look at those alongside and the fee structure as well. So if you're, um, if you're, you're, buy, you're investing in a, in a certain investment manager, I think it's quite important to look at how, how that fund manager is, is governed, how it remunerates its people in terms of fixed pay, how much is variable, when, when it, when's that variable paid, um, to what extent are they invested alongside you, um, and also to look at their own profitability and what their incentives relative to their profitability uh, are, um, and, and and look at look at that in 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 the round to make sure that they are their incentives are aligned with 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 yours. So I don't know if I answered that if that was the right question and I answered it right, but that that's that's a view on that. Um, completely agree uh, that we need to know where the climate the the carbon emissions are. Um, and we need to think about the methods and approaches to address address those um, in a in a holistic way across across a number of different groups. So you know, there's um, obviously the people who make the cars, there's people who use the cars, and then there's the people who allow the cars into the vicinity. Um, in in the, in the airport case, um, I think it is it is is bottom up. Um, I mean, the real, real estate example, we, you know, we got a partner in in in, in Argent. Um, uh, where, where we have a, had a common vision where we were both contributing to that. And um, I think a lot's evolved over the last seven or eight years where we, we've had the investment in terms of the learnings. Um, one of the things we were talking to them about, uh, I was in a meeting with them three, three or four weeks ago, was, was trying to understand in terms of the investment return, how much of that was driven by some of the, the positive social and environment things which which, which would be put in in terms of the increase in, in rents, which one was able to achieve because you, you've got a nice uh, op, op, open area. Um, and you've got people like Google who want to come in and, and take office, office space. So, so we, would, we, we, we still got that to do, but we, we, we'd like to work, work some of that through. In terms of the engagement with, with companies, I think they do fall into two, two buckets. There's the ones which I said were turkeys for, and Christmas. So there's... But there's still ways of moving forward with, with, with those companies. And we've had some really constructive discussions with some of the extractive companies, in the, uh, whether oil and gas or, or, or mining. Um, but with, with others, I think there are a lot of, I think a lot of the issue can be on the investor's side. Because investors aren't really organized to do engagement. Um, the, the best paid people are in front of the Bloomberg screen making investment decisions. And then typically you'll have a corporate governance function, which is to the side, um, not necessarily that well resourced in terms of number of people or in terms of the skills to be able to engage with someone who's been in, in business for, thir for 30 years. Um, and with the, in, you know, the pressure to get those short, short term returns from the asset owner, it's not always there, and I think we as an industry need to really evolve and evolve quickly to be to make stewardship not just the premium, but an integral part of what we provide as an industry. So I think there's, and, and I think on the other side, we'll have companies as, as partners. I think there's a lot of companies who really want to invest for the long term, but they don't have enough support from investors. Yeah, I just wanted to pick up this point about, um, about the banking sector and remuneration and so on. Um, I mean, obviously, the financial crisis now, 10 years ago or so, um, saw massive capital losses in <coughs> pension fund portfolios. Now, a lot of that has been recovered through a sort of qe fueled asset boom that's, that we've had and has really helped um, uh, the asset valuations of pension schemes. But that was a big capital loss, and that led to the creation of the stewardship code because at the heart of it, people analysed, hang on a minute, Bond managers looking after and supposedly keeping an eye on these banks were egging on a lot of risk-taking and so on. And um, 
And so we've got the stewardship code, which is great, but I think I wanted to flag up that we're going to have a review of the stewardship code next year. And one of the things that the FRC that oversees it is looking at is whether actually, because at the moment we just have a one size fits all code. Asset owners, asset managers are all subject to the same kind of six code, uh, six principles. But actually, the role of the asset manager is really quite different from the role of the asset owner. The asset owner needs to be really keeping an eye on the asset managers and whether they are managing, for example, conflict of interest. Now, there's a really interesting bit of academic research showing that asset managers don't tend to vote against remuneration arrangements at other financial services companies, whether it's banks or other asset management companies. There are challenges and conflicts in the asset management industry, and pension funds should be on top of them. And so one of the things I think we might see coming out of the review of the stewardship code next year is sort of guidance that says, well, actually, this is the role and this is what asset owners, pension funds should be doing, and this is the sort of role that asset managers should be doing. And we really need a world in which the asset owners are keeping a very beady eye on where the asset managers are doing a great job of stewardship. So I think that's a potentially very positive development and um, should help to get to grips with some of these residual challenges around whether asset managers always really do take um, uh, an appropriately tough line, and for example, in industries that are quite close to home, like financial services, banking, and indeed other asset management companies that are listed. Um, and then I just wanted to pick up on your question, which was around, well, you know, does this really make a difference? Does this actually contribute additionally to what um, companies end up doing? And I, and I think the evidence is that sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes boards of companies are just tone deaf completely. You're not going to change them. Um, but sometimes it really does. And I wanted to give one little anecdote. We, we have been doing some work over the last few years in a coalition, by the way, with lots of other investors, um, to ask public companies across the world to think about moving their operations onto 100% renewable electric power. And we turned up at the Tesco AGM um, and raised this with the board. And, you know, Tesco is obviously a big and very busy company, and Dave Lewis, the CEO, has a lot of things on his plate. And he hadn't really thought or looked at this question of renewable power and whether it really made sense for the company. But having been asked a question at the AGM, and also backed up by a letter from a group of um, institutional shareholders in Tesco, he kind of ordered a, a bit of a review. And then they made a decision, a really dramatic decision, that they are committing to 100% renewable electric power, and they've got a really ambitious timetable to put it in place. And it makes total business sense for Tesco. It's also going to be fantastic for the environment. And I think it's a really good example of something that, a comp you know, they might eventually have got there, but stewardship, active stewardship, got them there quicker. And that is the value that we can add as shareholders, you know, bringing issues to companies, nudging boards of directors to have a look at some of these kind of long-term strategic issues and really adding value. So uh, that's a nice example, but it doesn't always work. Cool. Um, we've got uh, a couple of minutes left, so if there's any uh, anyone else would like to ask a question, um, or um, there's one that I wanted to ask, so I'll, uh, I will take the opportunity to abuse the chair's privilege now, uh, and that relates to uh, a session I was at um, the other day that talked about um, a kind of there was a fund manager there, large fund manager, talking about a sort of responsible investment super trend. Uh, saying that they no longer get any mandates that don't include very high stu uh, stewardship requirements, either from uh, from institutional investors or from sort of high, the high net worth uh, individuals that they deal with. Um, and in each of your different perspectives, I was just wondering whether that sort of tallied with your experience that, that there is this increased expectation from your, uh, you know, your your clients or beneficiaries or um, you know, people that share action work with, um, that responsible investment and stewardship is, should be much more of a priority for, in, for investors. So I don't know if anyone wants to just say uh, a quick minute or two on that, perhaps starting with Michael. Yeah, uh, it certainly chimes with our experience. Um, we, RI is a big part of our selection process and we, we wouldn't appoint a manager unless we were confident they could deal with financially relevant uh, RI risks, um, th a big component of that is, is their stewardship output, but I think we have to be very careful as to what high standards of RI are, because a, a manager that just ticks boxes and doesn't do anything or can't explain why they've signed up to this initiative or why they've chosen to do a <coughs> carbon footprint or, or whatever it is, 
um, that's in the glossy brochures, if they can't explain why they're doing it and what, what value it adds, then that's probably worse than, than, than not having done anything at all. Yeah, no, the experience is that it's, it's featuring much more strongly in RFPs um, for different mandates, but where their investment mandate, obviously stewardship mandates, it would always feature. Um, so much, much stronger. And I think the investment industry is responding. So practically everyone now talks about this as if they've been doing it for 30 years. Um, and, um, and it's good that they're talking about it. There's still um, the ratio between talk and action is still somewhat higher than one. Um, <laughs> and that will change. Um, as people say they have to do things, then they then have to deliver. So it's moving in, in the right direction, but there's still more talk than action. Yeah, I would, I would really confirm that. So one, there's a, there's a huge trend, and I can only kind of celebrate that because <laughs> Share Action's been campaigning to achieve that for years, but I am frightened by the amount of box ticking. I'm frightened by the amount of marketing. And actually, I do think we're still at risk of missing some of the really, really big stories. And I just give one example. I mean, I am increasingly concerned that actually, and this is a positive thing, we really are moving now on a low carbon transition, but our pension funds are really, really very full <laughs> of um, integrated oil and gas majors that pay fantastic dividends. By the way, they've been borrowing for years to pay these dividends, so that's incredibly unsustainable and concerning. And, and I just think there are some really big stories sitting around in portfolios, and uh, I think um, overexposure in the pension sector to BP Shell and other very high-carbon companies is one where, you know, because they're such an important part of the benchmark, we're not really getting to grips with the issue, even though there is there's an absolute slew of disclosure and engagement chit chat with these companies. But they are, you know, they, they represent potentially the sort of risks in portfolios that banks represented before the crisis. And, and I just don't I think there's this level at which the whole responsible investment stuff is potentially still a bit superficial and not really getting to grips with some of those deeper um, risks that sit in portfolios that, that relate to some of these interesting transitions going on in the world. Cool. That's a great and challenging note to finish on and very topical because we at the PLSA are producing some guidance for trustees on uh, <coughs> or sort of climate change and how and why it relates to their investments. So that will be coming out um, a little later this year. So, uh, so do look out for it. Um, I should say we've got the, uh, the, uh, the, the, rate the session uh, gizmo on the conference app so please do provide any feedback it's always very useful I think right now we've got a uh, a little uh, there we go little uh, refreshment break so uh, go and uh, enjoy the the many stands on the conference floor and uh, but before we do if we could just thank the speakers in the usual way